Hello everybody, welcome back to The Marshal. Today we are going to be watching the part 3 of the Napoleon series by Geo History, The Decline this time. Yeah, um, if you haven't watched the two first videos, go down to the description and watch those and you can come back here. And of course, uh, watch the original videos and go to Geo History and support them, their, their content is amazing. So yeah, make sure to do that. Anyway, let's go and get on with the video. Napoleon controls almost the entire European continent. Having defeated Prussia and Austria, he tries hard to dominate Spain. In the West, the United Kingdom has always been his biggest opponent. The island is well defended by its powerful Royal Navy. The country sends an army to Portugal, which, with the help of local forces, chases away the French. They now threaten to take over Spain. To the east, Russia... So, just to... Quickly recap, uh, we are in 1812, uh, before the invasion of Russia. France is, a, is at this point huge. I think it is, so what it, it, I think I'm pretty sure that it's, it's the largest that it will probably ever be in influence on the European continent. Uh, it's, France itself is absolutely massive. They have just annexed some of Ara Aragon in Spain. He, in 1810, he annexed the Kingdom of Holland, which his uh, brother had previously uh, controlled. However, he lost more and more influence over the uh, Holland because he was very supportive of the Dutch people um, and wanted to make sure and wanted to protect them from more, uh, Napoleon's more harsher rules, which eventually got a uh, Napoleon angry and he was forced to abdicate and eventually uh, Holland got annexed. Uh, yeah, uh, he has control of Rome. Is Son is king of Rome, um, the Illyrian provinces, which Austria wants back, um, and a bunch of client states. So Sweden has just been, has just had a new monarch. Their old monarch, their, sorry, he's not king yet. Uh, Charles the 13th, I think it is at this point. Uh, Gustav the 4th, I think it was he, uh, 4th, I think it was Adolf. Gustav uh, the fourth Adolf, um, he got, he lost his throne because he was unable to uh, win the war against the Russians in Finland. So um, after the war, he was forced to abdicate, replaced by Charles the Thirteenth, who didn't have any children. So they point, they make um, Prince of Pontecorvo, uh, Jean Baptiste Bernadotte, they make him king, a uh, crown prince of Spain, under the name of Charles uh, Johann or Karl Johann. Denmark is Denmark Norway has also submitted to Napoleon after the British stole our fleet in uh, Copenhagen and bombarded the city and um, yeah the Duchy of Warsaw and his brother-in-law uh, Joachim Murat is king of uh, Naples uh, he doesn't control Sicily yet he has tried to invade it but he is not very good at it <laughs> uh, Murat and um, his brother is King of Spain, previously been the King of Naples. However, after Ferdinando the Seventh uh, abdicated, he was uh, Joseph was appointed King of Spain. Um, and yeah, um, he's not. And many French soldiers are at the moment tied down in a guerrilla warfare against the Spanish, but also against the British army, as he just mentioned. And they have just liberated Portugal, which I think is Massena, a uh, Massena who has been dri driven out from uh, Portugal and um, Wellington was able to feed him at force him out after the after the meeting at the Lions of Taurus Vetras. So um, yeah, lots of stuff going on and, it is, and, and it's probably the worst time at the moment to invade uh, Russia because the British are still in the war. The continental blockade is not going very well. He is tight. He's just lost Portugal and the army invading Portugal has forced out. It's probably the worst time at the moment. To, um, to invade Russia, but he does it anyway. Russia and France see a gradual weakening in their relationship, although they're officially allied. Russia has never backed Napoleon in his wars and now refuses to implement the continental blockade imposed by Napoleon on the UK. Not only that, it is absolutely correct. One of the main reasons was because uh, the continental blockade, that was why the Russians went out 
of the uh, and the war began. However, um, not only that, but um, I think they got out in eighteen twelve. But anyway, ten sorry eighteen ten. But anyway, not only but it, that is not the only thing. Uh, there's also Napoleon have confiscated land in Oldenburg. Which um, was ruled uh, by the, I think it was the Duke of Oldenburg, married to Sir Alexander's sister, uh, Catherine. I think it was Catherine Pavlina, uh, Lona or what, pa- pa- Lena or something, something like that. But anyway, so he has annexed territory that is owned by a man who is who is related who is related to him by marriage, uh, the Emperor of Russia. So um, that has annoyed him. Uh, when there was also when Napoleon tried to propose to Alexander's other sister Anna Pavlina, however she, the Tsar refused. And now there is also Sweden, French influence in Sweden, which could potentially, uh, which would potentially take Finland back, perhaps. So I mean, yeah, there are many things. That, there are many things that tear down Russian and French relations around this time. Having had enough, Napoleon plans to invade Russia. He gathers more than 650,000 soldiers from all over Europe and signs alliances with Prussia and Austria. Yeah, he um he had a meeting in Dresden where every monarch in Europe except a few like the King of Sweden and Russia and all sorts of people they actually met uh, in uh, this party in Dresden. So yeah, every arm, basically all of his client states are involved in this invasion. It's 650,000 men who are going into Russia. Meanwhile, Russia signs a peace treaty with the Ottoman Empire and prepares its troops at the border. Napoleon hopes for a blitz and an easy victory that would force the Tsar to negotiate peace. His army crosses the Neman River towards the Russian armies. Its south wing is constituted of an Austrian contingent and its north wing by Prussia. But the Russian armies, largely outnumbered, avoid engaging in battle and retreat deep into the land. Napoleon then accelerates the pace and tries to catch up. His supply lines are stretched quickly, requiring excellent organization by many men. The Russians deploy the scorched earth tactic, burning down everything in their path while retreating. And he nearly caught them as Smolensk. Nearly, however, a birth- birthday celebration which included 100 uh, shots or uh, 100 uh, musket shots as a salute to um, his birthday and Chenot who was screwed up and wasn't able to get, get stop the Russians even though he could have easily done so but for some reason didn't follow his order, orders um, if, I, he had, if he had uh, marched forward and actually blo- blocked the road, road he would probably have been able to um, to stop the Russians, but yeah, he was not. He didn't do it for some reason. He would later commit suicide because of it. Many soldiers die of exhaustion along the way. Finally reaching the gates of Moscow, Napoleon and his 130,000 remaining soldiers go face to face with 120,000 Russians. The battle proves to be a bloody affair, which France wins with great difficulty. Napoleon and his 100,000 men enter Moscow, which was evacuated. A week later, Russian soldiers set fire to the city. During five weeks, Napoleon tries to negotiate peace with the Tsar, but receives no response. Eventually, as winter is coming, Napoleon is forced to retreat. Along the way, the troops at the back of his formation are subject to constant attack. Further west, two Russian armies prepare to block his retreat. Napoleon understands that he must hurry if he does not want his army to be annihilated. His troops, exhausted and starving, now suffer from the frost and snow. Horses die of exhaustion and are eaten, while the artillery is abandoned. When they reach the Berezina River, a Russian... Okay, he's skipping through this quite fast, which is understandable. It's just meant to be kind of short. However, at one moment, um, at the Battle of Krasny, uh, the Imperial, the army is just able to get out of a trap by uh, Miloradovich and the Russian army. However, 
um, Marshall Ney and his third car is left behind. So he actually does a, a insane feat where he marches past the Russian army without the Russian army no- noticing it, and through fighting and and uh, ma- and a long marches, he was able to reunite with the French army again, like on the So yeah. Russian army is stationed in front of the bridge to block them. Napoleon discreetly sends men further north to build two bridges. Eventually, while the French troops cross the river, the Russian battalion approaching from the north reaches them. Bridges are... Yet also organized a diversion, I think it was Victor who was sent to do that, down here to distract the Russian army, which totally fools Chikikov on the other side. And he's able to cross because of that. ...burned to prevent the Russians from following them condemning the fate of the remaining 10,000 French soldiers who could not cross on time. Only a few tens of... It was actually the stragglers, aka people, men who had given up. They kind of refused to cross, but when they saw the Russians coming, they panicked and ran over and many drowned, many got stampeded to death and yeah, it wasn't really, it wasn't all that clean, to say the least. Thousands of French soldiers managed to leave Russia, while Napoleon leaves alone for Paris. There had just been a coup against him a couple of months a couple of months earlier. Upon reaching Paris, Napoleon moves quickly to raise a new army. Meanwhile, the Tsar, despite being weakened by war, continues the offensive, knowing he has much to gain if he becomes the liberator of Europe. The Tsar moves diplomatically closer to Prussia, which considers the possibility of freeing the Confederation of the Rhine from Napoleon. This would render Prussia as the new influential power in the region. The King of Prussia discreetly prepares his armies. Austria chooses to be neutral for the moment while the Confederation of the Rhine remains loyal to Napoleon. Once the Russian army is at the gates of Berlin, Prussia declares war on France. Together, they leave for Saxony to fight what is left of Napoleon's great army. But the latter is joined by Napoleon's new army and with a few victories, they force Prussia and Russia to seek a truce. I am not really all that sure about why the Swedish army is not represented. The Swedish were also involved in the war under Crown Prince Bernadotte. I think actually they declared war before Prussia did. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's able to push them back. Uh, they're trying to kind of force him to cross into Austria to uh, break the neutrality of uh, the Austrians and kind of force Austria into war on their side. However, the Austrians instead organized the truce of Blatzwitz, which we are going into right now. Meanwhile, in the Iberian Peninsula, Wellington's army, along with the Portuguese and Spanish forces, seizes Madrid and is preparing to expel the French from the country. During the truce, while the armies are reinforced on both sides, the battle plays out on the diplomatic level. Sweden joins the coalition, while Austria offers... They had already joined the coalition. I'm pretty sure they are already in the war this time. I'm pretty sure they had declared war before Prussia did. Mediation to Napoleon. Austria suggests to restore the so-called natural frontiers of France in exchange for peace. But Napoleon does not take up the offer and Austria joins the coalition. Of course, there's that famous story when Metternich, the foreign minister in uh, Austria, uh, meets with Napoleon and Napoleon is so, so angry over this proposal. The proposal that the Confederation of the Rhine should be destroyed, that the Illyrian province is given back, that Poland is repositioned, all these things. They are ex- extremely, uh, Napoleon is extremely angry over this. He accuses the Austrians, who have not even joined the war yet, um, of being paid by the British, and he throws his head on the ground and yells at them. And yeah, that's kind of what erupts, erupts this war. Sorry that I don't really, <laughs> that I sound kind of dumb. I'm Danish, so. The truce is broken causing the three great armies to march on to the Confederation of the Rhine. Their advance forces Napoleon to play the defensive card. 
he retreats to Leipzig, where a decisive battle involving half a million men takes place. During three days, the French and their allies resist the offensive, but besieged on three fronts, they finally must retreat. During battle, the only functioning bridge is destroyed too early, condemning a third of the French army. So, um... I'm, I don't want to get too picky here, alright? I get it, it's just overview. But the armies are, compens are, are, compensation, are completely wrong. The Swedish and the, were, the Prussians were around here. The Swedish were around here, the Russians were coming. I think under Wittgenstein, they were coming from here. And Schwarzenberg was here with his Austrians, his massive Austrian force. And there were many battles before that. There was the Battle of Dresden, there was many battles and yeah, it's kind of simplified here. Um, yeah, um, what happened was, was that um, uh, essentially uh, Napoleon, at first he tries to attack Schwarzenberg in the hopes of he can defeat Schwarzenberg and then get to Blücher and then get to the others one by one. However, Blücher comes earlier than he expected. Uh, he had expected him coming in a day, but he came on the day, I suppose you can say. He expected him to come tomorrow, but he came uh, on the 16th of October, the first day of the battle. Um, so, um, yeah. And that forced him to split his army up. Second day, there isn't really much fighting on the 17th of October. The 18th is primarily just um, defense on Napoleon's part. Uh, some massive artillery battles up here, and yeah, um, I don't want to get too technical into this, but um, eventually he gives up and retreats. Uh, it is not his fault that the bridge blew up. It was actually, I think it was a young soldier, I, I think it was a colonel at the start, who then gave it to a someone else, and that person gave it to a soldier, who panicked and, li and lit the fuse that exploded the bridge. Marshal Poniatowski, who had been marshaled for four days, drowned in the river. McDonald just escaped. I think also Mac uh, Udino was on the wrong side, but how somehow made it over. I never really... Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I've read some accounts he was on the other side. Others say that he was in, some say he was in Leipzig. Some say he had already escaped. Uh, can somebody in the comments please clarify it for me? I've never really known which one is true or not. But besieged on three fronts, they finally must retreat. During battle, the only functioning bridge is destroyed too early, condemning a third of the French army. Napoleon crosses the Rhine with only 70,000 men, while the Confederation of the Rhine joins the coalition. Meanwhile in Spain, the French army, chased by Wellington, is pushed back to the borders. France is besieged from all sides. The French armies, completely outnumbered, resist as well as they can the advance towards the country. Morat had turned against them, as you see down in Naples. The last ally he had, Denmark, Norway, is invaded by the Swedish because they had been promised Norway in exchange for help. Uh, yeah, the Swedish army, I'm pretty sure the Swedish army was, was moving up here, up to Denmark at this point. I think it's only later where they began, begin to move into France. But the coalition eventually enters Paris. Napoleon, who is in Fontainebleau, is forced to abdicate. Napoleon loses all powers. He is then forced by the coalition to go into exile with a few hundred men on the island of Elba, over which he has sovereignty. In France, the monarchy is restored and King Louis XVIII accedes to the throne. In Vienna, the victors meet for several months in order to redraw the new borders of the continent and try to establish a long-term peace plan for Europe. Representatives from small states are not given a voice in the negotiation. Big powers lead the discussions and carve up territories. The Duchy of Warsaw mainly becomes Congress Poland in a personal union with the Tsar of Russia. Prussia extends westwards, while the Confederation of the Rhine becomes the German Confederation. Austria recovers many lost territories, while old kingdoms are recreated in Italy. The United Kingdom of the Netherlands and Sweden-Norway are created. Finally, Switzerland's neutrality is recognized by all. From his island... Nip as a Dane myself, as a person from Denmark, we hear a lot about 
us losing Norway. That was a huge thing. We had had Norway for hundreds of years by that point. So yeah, us, the fact that we lost it was a gigantic thing for us. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, that's that's what I, the commentary I have to say about that. Napoleon follows closely developments on the continent, especially in France. He knows that the return of the monarchy is little appreciated by the people. For one, not eventually it became unpopular. But actually, the first they welcomed Louis the uh, the 18th to Paris. However, um, over time, because of the occupation by the British, combined with um, there were British soldiers there, and combined and that kind of crashed the economy in some ways. Um, and yeah, other things like uh, the inefficiency of the monarchy politically and all sorts of things. Uh, that eventually led to the monarchy becoming extremely unpopular and allowing Napoleon to return. One last time, he would decide to try and regain power. He secretly leaves for France. Yeah, so he lands in, um, in France uh, with only 1,026 1 men and I think 44 cavalry and six cannons i think he arrives on the ship Le Inconstant in and yeah his his captive the man the british commander in charge of keeping he, he, keeping an eye on him niall uh, campbell was his name he had taken a trip to livorno in italy uh, because of a medical check however it could also because his mistress was in the city perhaps but perhaps that was it but yeah um, so he escapes during this time and um, he returns to France, where again, the monarchy is becoming more and more reactionary, more and more unpopular. The economy is going badly, so they decide that Napoleon thinks it's the perfect time. And yeah, it is pretty much for him. Napoleon lands near Cannes with a few hundred men. On his way to Paris, he receives a hero's welcome in cities, while French troops also join him. When he reaches the most famous example is probably Grenoble, where he marched, he walked forward and showed the medal of the Legion of Honor and um, walked forward and they played the Marseille and he said, Soldiers, if you wish to kill your emperor, here I am. And um, they defected to him en masse. Which is the capital. The king has already fled and Napoleon gets back power. But in Vienna, heads of state form a seventh coalition. Napoleon prepares the country for war. In the Netherlands, an army under the Duke of Wellington's command is prepared, while in Prussia, Blücher's army goes to join him. In the east, an Austrian army is waiting to be joined by the Russian army, which would arrive several months later. Napoleon decides to make the first move. If he can prevent the armies of Wellington and Blücher from joining forces, he may then also be successful in preventing the Austrian and Russian armies from doing the same. He leaves immediately with 125,000 men. Upon arrival, the Prussian army finds itself stretched and disorganized, while the army of the Duke of Wellington consisting of soldiers from Britain, the Netherlands and German states is positioned near Brussels. Napoleon just about managed... There is fear on Wellington's part because there had been cavalry reports going up through the Mons Road which is around here. There were French invade through Charleroi and they, there's cavalry, there are skirmishes on the Mons Road so Wellington is afraid that his supply lines in the west is going to be cut off uh, that's why he waits a bit to see what happens. And of course also the Duchess of uh, Richmond's ball and all that. Uh, yeah. Um, and the armies are scattered over a large distance at this time. They take a bit of time to uh, get them together. ...manages to prevent both armies from joining forces and pushes them both further north. An army of 30,000 men chases the Prussian troops while Napoleon advances towards Wellington who has positioned himself on a ridge near Waterloo. The next day, the French army which is reaching Wavre sees most of the Prussian army leaving westwards and decides not to chase them 
instead preferring to attack the garrisons left behind in the city. On the Western Front, Napoleon and Wellington engage in fierce battle. In the afternoon, as Napoleon seems to be winning, the first Prussians arrive from the east. Napoleon has no choice but to send some of his men on the Eastern Front, which leads to his defeat. Yeah, it was Cruci, the newly appointed Marshal Cruci, who had previously been actually a very good general, but he completely uh, uh, screws up and his orders were to get in between the army, the army of Wellington and the army of Blucher. However, he's unable. He may, he may have in, misinterpreted his orders, or maybe the orders were just too vague. But nevertheless, he decides to engage the rear guard at Levre, at Wavre. And yeah, it's a victory, but a meaningless victory because Napoleon loses with his, most of his army. Napoleon goes back to Paris and tries for the last time to form an army, but the government refuses. He then leaves incognito to Rochefort, where he hopes to board a ship for the United States. But British soldiers are checking the port. After wandering for several days, Napoleon, aware he's a wanted man, tries his luck and asks the British to take him to the United States. But instead, they take him to the island of St. Helen, which would become Napoleon's last prison. Isolated and closely surveyed in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, he would no longer be able to influence anyone anymore. He writes his memoirs, eventually falls sick, dies on May 5, 1821 and is buried in the island. In 1840, his remains are unearthed and brought back to the Invalides in Paris. To this day, it serves as Napoleon's tomb. Extremely good. Make sure to check out their channel, of course. They are extremely good. All credit to them, of course, to Geo History. Uh, anyway, um, thank you for watching this video. More videos are to come. Uh, yeah, see you later. Hi.